Hey everyone, this is Chris Keyes. I'm outside Exact Tone Solutions. You might ask, what is Exact Tone Solutions or XTS to us in the know? They are a pedal company based in Nashville, Tennessee, but their flagship service is building rigs. Good friend Barry O'Neill, who also writes for the magazine in the State of the Stomp column, let me know that he's got a special rig that he wanted us to come down and film, and they're gonna tell us all about it. When we get inside, we'll let the cat out of the bag. But if you saw the title of this video, you already know what we're looking at. All right, let's go. All right, everyone, we're inside XTS. Barry, how you doing? I'm doing well, man. It's really good to have you here. Yeah, thank you for letting us come in here. Like I said, Barry writes for the Premier Guitar Magazine, State of the Stomp. So uh, got any pedal problems, I'm sure he can help you out with those. Barry, what are we looking at today? Uh, we're looking at two things, two copies of one thing. This is uh, the A and B rig for Caleb Followell of Kings of Leon. And so these are complete rebuild, uh, sort of a... Uh, we're just jumping things forward as far as tech. He was on uh, the Ground Control Pro by Voodoo Lab and the GCX Switcher, and that stuff has all been replaced by these brand new fancy uh, RJM Mastermind GTs. Uh, this is the tech one here. And then downstage uh, at Kayla's feet will be this board. So in addition to having that Mastermind, he's got a tuner both for acoustic and electric. And you can also see on there that J48DI to return his acoustic signal back to uh, front of house. And then you've got a custom interface down there and all those color coded inputs are just there to make sure that it's as easy as possible to get this thing set up. But, you know, like we were talking earlier, the kind of the funny thing about this setup is how simple uh, it is. It's really only eight pedals and the pedals are split across these fixed uh, pedal board shelves uh it's these four are the first in the signal chain uh that's uh and the order is maybe not what you would anticipate it actually hits this gar uh, garage tone delay first then this pog then this chorus then the micro amp and then we leave this shelf and we come down to the second shelf which again is maybe set up a little bit different than you would anticipate uh the trem is first on this shelf and then the full drive and then the space echo and then the rv5 and then that returns down here to this jx44 which is doing all the switching duties so the radio up here the accent radio it's got a two channel one now that'll change out for a four channel and each one of those channels will run down to this jx44 so that the tech can pick which uh channel of wireless he wants to run or a wired in should um, stuff in RF world kind of go uh, haywire. So you can pick that, sends out to the effects, which get controlled uh, by these Megex uh, loop switchers. And then you can pick which output you want run, to run to. In this setup, we've got an amp here, an A, a backup amp here, and B. And this D here serves as the acoustic out that'll run downstage, that'll, you know, it can be muted and or tuned down there by Caleb. So Despite the fact that these are kind of big, complicated things, they're not that complicated. If, if it was a pedal board, it would be this big. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not super uh, complicated as far as the stuff. As we were talking about, what makes these things get big in a way is the demands of all the other departments. So monitors want something front of house wants something the tech needs something and what the player needs is obviously paramount uh, but you've got all these other people who need very specific things from these rigs so even like this tech uh, board here like all i can switch this down here with my foot and you can see that this trim state is changing so if player wants to walk away from a board uh, to do some cool rock star stuff uh, he or she can do that, and then the tech can manage these cues or even switch presets uh, all together. So the fact that you can mirror with these masterminds is a big uh, improvement over the, the older Voodoo Lab stuff that they're getting off of. So uh, as the adage goes, uh, one is none, two is one. So we have, um, you know, an A unit and a B unit that will travel with them. And then there'll actually be a C unit as well, which will be strictly for studio use. And they'll all be exactly the same. 
Now, what are some special things that you had to do that you, you alluded to the pedal ordering that they'd love to keep, or at least Caleb wanted to keep because that's what he's been using or, nor, you know, used to. What are some other things that you had to accommodate for this, you know, request? Yeah, well, that's, that's really the first one. And, you know, the, having that conversation as you're kind of, we've done lots of work for Kings of Leon. In fact, Caleb will be the last member that we have done something for. So now we've worked for Matt, Jared, Nathan, and Caleb. So there's that kind of getting to know you period where you're trying to feel like how precious is a player or a tech about this stuff, like the order. So even as, as Josh, uh, Caleb's tech was laying this out, like, all right, what, what is the default loop order? And he laid them out and I'm maybe raised an eyebrow and said, Hey, this is a little weird. Uh, and he's like, I know he's like, we're just keeping, that's what he's used to. Uh, that's what he's comfortable with. And really that's the way more important than right. Yeah. Is keeping, uh, keeping the guy who pays the bills, uh, happy. Uh, and so keeping things the same is very critical because you want everything to feel right upon first introduction. Yeah. And this, this rig should roll in and, uh, players should be able to play through it and not know that anything really changed. Uh, it can have extra features. Like now they can reorder stuff with these Megaxes and stuff like that. If they want to experiment with different orders, they can do that, but it's got to feel like home mm -hmm. at the beginning. And if it doesn't, uh, that's trouble. The other features we needed to do was the stuff with like the, the radio switching and stuff like that. Anybody who's done this kind of work can know that handoff and how to manage them, what pack is on and, how am I going to get you an instrument on a different pack and all that sort of stuff that can be kind of tricky to handle. Uh, this gives them the options of like, I can actually turn on two packs, walk out there with one pack muted, hand that to my artist and then switch the packs uh, on and off and I'm good to go. So even before I get back to my position and backline as a tech, everything's, everything's good. You just want it to be easy. Mm -hmm. Everything needs to be easy. Uh, this thing is going to be set up and struck uh, every day. It needs to roll in. It needs to work every time. And and getting it getting it up and running has got to be really simple. And that's like even little things like the color coding. Like who has time to read labels? Just match the colors, plug it in, and you're good. Um, other things. Um, I was going to say, what kind of troubleshooting do you go through knowing that, okay, this works, but it's almost like you're trying to make it fail before you hand it off to to, sure. to the band. Yeah, so one thing that we do here before we'll send anything out is we listen with like an amp with an obnoxious amount of gain. Because we want there to be no quarter for any buzzes, hums, any weirdness at all. We, we don't want to give anything a place to hide. So we don't want to deliver something after, you know, testing it, you know, on... A super clean setting and then they go well he runs his amp way gainier and now it's kind of tattling so that's one thing is just hyping things as as much as possible and then going through all the permutations of all right if is if this out is on and this is out is on what's going to happen if we cycle through each pedal is it behaving like we think that it should and just really testing all the combinations so that the end user won't be doing anything with it you haven't already done yeah so you're just trying to exhaust all the combinations and all the possibilities the rest as far as making sure it works is really just uh taking the experience that you know greg eric and i have here in the shop building these things and applying those things forward like we've often said you know it osha says safety rules are written in blood a lot of the stuff that we do here is because we've been burned before. So <laughs> yeah. it's like, okay, I need to, even little things like these rack panels, like just making doubly sure that they're grounded properly so that they'll resist EMF injection and all that stuff. That comes from, you know, like, why is this buzzing? And then you find out there's some tiny little thing that you didn't do. And then you always do that thing from here from here on out. So it's little things like that, the best practices thing. But as far as what you're talking about exactly, that shakedown thing is just very rigorously using it. Mm -hmm. And then you're trying to look at it in as 
unfriendly and as stark a light as possible. So as much gain, as much level, so that if you had a little tiny noise, it would be totally magnified. And, uh, and then things like, even little things, like if we spin this one around, which is a copy of this one that's set up here and on, like on this panel here, these are all grouped. These are the ones going downstage. And so as opposed to having some over here and some over here, that are going the same place. If we just group them all, he can land that loom here and be done. Mm -hmm. These two go to uh, Tech World. They're for that local mastermind controller. And then these are all front of house things. So these will be from either RF engineering or just local antennas. And then these guys are gonna go either to backline or to RF as well. And then little things too. Like I remember for years, we got bit by these little IECs backing out. And when we did the Billy Strings rig, uh, Michael Bethencourt, who builds for Jason Isbell, mm -hmm. uh, turned us on to these guys. They lock. So now we don't worry about that stuff anymore. I can open and close it with the IEC. So there's like little things like that. And then too, like that conduit down there. You might think, well, MIDI will just come in and then hit one and daisy chain into all the other things. Experience tells us that that will likely work, but there's a chance that it might not work. So we're, we're never going to run series more than a couple things because it's not worth the 150 bucks for the conduit to risk it. Just put it in there and, uh, and hook it up knowing that that's going to give you more reliability. And the other cool thing about using these Megaxes, as far as just keeping things simple, you guys have probably seen like the, the rack mount effect gizmo, mm -hmm. right? Uh, every pedal would have a pair that would run out of this shelf in a great big loom that would come up and then come up into the into the effects gizmo. The nice thing about doing local switching right here is there's just three lines in here. There's an in to the Meg X, an out from the Meg X, and then MIDI to the Meg X, and that's it. Way less cable, way less looping to catch EMF and stuff like that, and then uh, more flexibility because if this changes to something and these cables become obsolete, instead of fishing that cable all the way through the rack, it's all right here. And it makes it super simple to change stuff. The Zuma is a big part of that as well because the Zuma is way overkill for everything on this drawer. Uh, they can change it for just about anything that will come out and have options uh, to be able to power it. So all it's, even though this rig, the, the players clearly haven't changed in probably the last 15 years, uh, there's no reason why it has to be that way. We want to leave the tech and the artist room to be able to change stuff uh, going forward. Having the Meg X's on the drawer and having kind of overkill for power uh, helps that. It mm -hmm. makes everything easier to debug should something break on the road because the road's pretty vicious. Now, something like the Meg X and anything else that you've instituted that you've already kind of talked about, is, mm -hmm. is that something you have to have a conversation as a consultant? We'll call you the rig consultant? Yeah. Or, or is that something you get kind of more of a, not carte blanche, but it's like, you know that better. Like, where, where does the conversation start and end in terms of that type of stuff? It'll usually start, well, one, the people that we work with are super high level and they will probably know about most of this stuff. So what it will usually practically work out is be like, hey, we were thinking Meg X's, and they'll go, yeah, 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 that'd be great. Now, maybe they say, we've never heard of that, what is that? And then the pitch would be, well, if you do that, just what I told you, you can, you, you can have one per shelf, and the pedals would be easy to change, there'd be a lot less cable running around, and, but everything is submitted, it's, it's, because, this is a service mm -hmm. that we provide. And as soon as I give these over to Josh, if something goes wrong, the first person they call won't be me, it'll be Josh. Yeah. So he has to have full ownership of what's going on here. He needs to be totally comfortable with it. The artist needs to be totally com comfortable with it. The production team needs to be totally comfortable with it. Like we talked about, there's, there's some things in here that are not how I would do them if I was if I had carte blanche, like you said, but it's not just my baby. Yeah. And so we need to deliver something that absolutely everybody on the team feels comfortable with. And 
because if something, if let's say we delivered something that was exactly what I wanted and I berated them and beat them over the head until they let me do what I, what I wanted to do. Uh, after we deliver that and something goes wrong, I, there's no way we can win. Yeah. Because they're like, these XTS guys were complete jerks and they forced us to do this thing that we didn't want to do. And then something went wrong and it was their fault. So there needs to be a cooperation in that us working with them, them working with us. And these things wind up, particularly big rigs like this, wind up being very much a team effort with multiple departments uh, on the production side, weighing in techs, backline and us kind of going around in a circle in either phone conversations or email threads, uh, trying to figure out what is the thing that's going to serve us all best. And usually that produces something, even if it's not something that any of us would want by ourselves, it's something we've all agreed upon. This is the best move for all of us. Yeah. And, and there's safety in that much counsel for sure. There's, there's so much more that goes beyond than just guitar tone. When it comes to something on this level of, of what needs to be thought of to get to you know a rig that's assembled like this, that like yeah. you said, might not necessarily be this way, not even so much in the routing, but you could get away with this, like you said earlier, just on the pedal board, but the needs that they require to be an arena rock band. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that, like it's so much more than guitar tone. From our perspective on this rig in particular, the tone is kind of irrelevant. Yeah. Um, like if we thought they were using something that was gonna hurt them, like cause it was gonna break or die or something, we would kind of raise our hand and say, hey, have you thought about this? But they had already had this, nobody asked us what we thought the band sounded like or what could we do to make them sound better. That's a foregone conclusion. This is the stuff we use. How can we use it to make it easier for everybody to use and for it to work well uh, every single night? So it's f funny you say that, but like from our perspective, certainly not Caleb's perspective and not backline text, but from, from our perspective, the tone is, we don't want it to sound bad by any <laughs> means, but they've already made all those decisions yeah. and we're, we're implementing. We want to preserve every ounce of tone that they've got so that they're, it can, all this stuff can sound as good as it can, but it doesn't matter if I think that pog is the best pog. So it's, that's the one that they're using. Yeah. So we're going to make it go as best as we can. Are there any fail safes that you have in this system for, you know, in a situation, something goes down that doesn't necessarily take either the whole system down or maybe trap doors for Josh to get in and out of quicker? Sure. Uh, that's the great thing about these loop switching systems because everything is in there. This micro amp, it will probably never fail. But if it does, uh, all I got to do is bypass it. And so the most likely thing is that one of these pedals is going to take a dump and each one of those pedals is easy to ditch. The JX44, there's an escape hatch in that, like, let's say uh, Megax went down or something like that. I can kill all the effects to amp A. He would be totally dry and it would not be fun, but he would not be dead. And that's an important thing. Mm -hmm. So we could, he, or he could kill effects for a second and then debug what's going on on one of these two shelves. You know, maybe something rattled out here down the road or like if, if that one jack there backed out, it would kill everything. And maybe it's stuck together during line check and he just needs to reseed it. Push that in, come back here, get the effects back on that amp, and you're back good to go. The nice thing about putting everything in racks is nobody's stepping on it anymore. And, uh, you know, the fact that we stomp on these things is one of the main reasons why they fail. Yeah. So we've limited, we've limited that by getting things back on the rack means no water gets in them, no beer gets in them. It's just way better, again, from a production side of things. It's way more complicated. It makes the rig way more expensive to remote everything. But now Caleb's free to do what he does, sing, play guitar, and he can make his effect switches. But if something goes down, he's not bending over to look at that. And yeah. Josh doesn't have to run out to look at it. Everything's safe and tucked away. The audience may not even ever be aware of, of something going wrong. And that's kind of what we all want. We want the show to go on and for the tech part of it uh, to, to not be anybody's concern but ours.
What about front of house and, and specific to this request, uh, this rig, were there anything's requested for them? Sure, they want the acoustic. Uh, they wanted these J48s. Uh, they were actually, uh, I guess it'd be more of an engineering thing in general, but they were concerned about uh, not having audio out on the deck and maybe implementing some some paradigm changes, like I said, that maybe we would have done had we had carte blanche, and it's okay. Um, but they were like, hey, we'd, we'd feel more comfortable if we do this, and that's totally fine. So then we kind of arrive at the, at the setup as it sits right now. Um, the nice thing is, is we kind of leave things so that we might, if they come back and say, hey, remember those things that we were talking about as just ideas in the beginning? Mm -hmm. Can we implement those now? And be like, yeah, we can do that. There's, it's not tied so tight and uh, configured so tight that, uh, that that wouldn't be possible. So there is some flexibility uh, in it still. But, uh, but yeah, like you're saying, there's a bunch of people who want uh, different things. Like the last minute thing was Josh was like, hey, can, can, we, can we do some... Um, uh, coax entries for uh, antennas because that way he's not fishing those through to the back uh, of the radio itself. They go to the panel and then automatically route up. The nice thing about that is if he got into a situation where it was a stagehand landing things, instead of having potentially a non-technical stagehand trying to land things in your rack, mm -hmm. it's right on a panel and there's less that they could potentially do to, to hurt you. And there's less confusion and all that stuff as well. So there's little things like that, which kind of make all the difference. And even dumb things like we were talking about the lights in the back, yeah, uh, make a huge practical difference. And we were, in fact, we were surprised by that because when we started doing it, it was like, oh, this will be nice, I guess. And we started doing it. It was like, why haven't we been doing this forever? Uh, so little things like that, all that kind of, uh, all that kind of adds up for sure. All right. Barry, this is a, a very complicated and beautiful rig that you put together. I'm sure people will see, and if not see it, they will hear it soon on the road in the Kings Leon tour this summer and fall. But if they want to have any of your services done for their rig, where should they go to contact you guys? Yeah, you can give us a call in our Nashville uh, custom shop. You can look us up at exactone.com or our Instagram is uh, at exactone. Uh, we do, we do stuff that's way simpler than this. We've done some stuff that's more complicated uh, than this. So uh, if you need something like that or something completely different, give us a buzz. Yeah, and you've done stuff, you know, obviously Kings of Leon, but, you know, just anybody that, you know, needs in services, pedal pedal repair or pedal boards, you know, even someone like John Bollinger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, in addition to rock stars like John, uh, <laughs> we, we, serve, we serve the common man as well. <laughs> awesome, Barry. Thank you for your time. All right. Killer.